Good morning. Our passage this morning is from Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is God's word for today. You may be seated. During this Advent season, we look forward to the coming light of Jesus, our Savior. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. To celebrate and anticipate his coming, we light the Advent candles each week leading up to Christmas. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for sending the light of your son, Jesus, into the darkness of our world. Help us to walk in his light, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit would illuminate our hearts so that we might know you and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing our brief series, Advent, God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. And it's, it's, the subject matter of this is encountering the Holy Spirit. So last week we looked at the bookends the bookends of the Gospel of Matthew. So you have the coming, the announcement of Jesus' coming birth, and the angel says to Joseph, quoting Isaiah chapter chapter 7, verse 14, he says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So so that's the the coming, the announcement of his son, is that the the the, the Godhead is coming in the person of Christ. And and then When Jesus, just before his ascension, as he commissions his disciples, as he commissions the church to be the church, he says, go therefore and make disciples, learners, followers of of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we talked about last week, Dallas Willard, a very um, insightful um, insightful translation of that may, go and, and baptize. He says it, it can be translated immerse them in the presence of the Trinity. Immer- that's what it means to be baptized, to be, immerse, to be immersed into the presence of God. So it's not just get them wet and then speak the names, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It means to be immersed into the presence of God. It's the fulfillment of, of what the angel, what the angel told Joseph, Emmanuel, God with us. And and he says, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's God's desire for each and every one of us, that you and I, that we corporately, and you and I individually, we would experience the presence, the presence of God. This goes way, way beyond simply being justified, which is great that we're declared not guilty, that we're, de- that we're declared righteous by f- grace through faith in Christ. This goes into, this speaks to the experience, experience on a daily basis, the presence and the power of God. Now, that might not be your experience. So that's the purpose of this, of this series. And, uh, series. And last week we looked at the introduction, the, the question of, well, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Spirit? Apart from the Spirit, we can't experience the presence of God. But through the Spirit, we can, uh, we can have the experience of Christ in our hearts, in our lives, and we can also be empowered. So last week was the introduction. Today we're going to look at the, the promise, the promise of the giving of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit. So that's what we're going to focus on today. The promise that, that we would be baptized, that, that that's, the word means to be immersed so if we're going to be baptized in the name of the Father, Holy Son, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, immersed into the presence of God, how does that work? How does that happen? When did it happen? If it happened, when did it happen? Are, is that your current experience? Or is that just something you re- read about in, in the scriptures? That's what we're going to look at. So four things we're going to see. We're going to see the promise, the fulfillment, the effect, and then how, 
how do we experience that? What is our experience? I mean, yes, there's the baptism of the Spirit as it occurred at Pentecost uh, and in Acts chapter 2, but what does that look like today? And how do you and I experience it? The goal here is for all of us, all of us, again, to, 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 to experience that presence, experience that power. So for some of you, for some of you, this message will serve to help you understand what you already possess, for some of you. For others of you, this will help you understand what you do not yet possess, but desperately need. And it's all by grace. So let's go to the Lord, let's pray, and then we will open up the scriptures. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this Christmas season that reminds us that you are not a distant God that you are not absent, but that you, in fact, are with us because you have sent your Son and you have sent your Spirit. Father, we pray that through the preaching of your Word, that the Holy Spirit inspired, that you would quicken our hearts, encourage those who are weary. Uh, Lord, light a fire in those who are apathetic. And Lord, those who are dead in their sins, who are not yet followers of you, I pray that you would make them alive in Christ. That's all a work of your Spirit. So we are utterly dependent upon you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's take a look, first of all, at the promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, we have to, we have to back it up and, and understand the context. First of all, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're Genesis chapter 1. God created the heavens and the earth, and it says in Genesis chapter 1 that the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth, hovering over the deep. And, and then God begins his creative process, day one, day two. And by the end of that creative process, it says that he created man in his image. Male and female, he created them. So you and I, mankind was created in the image of God. We are his image bearers. It doesn't matter if you were a follower of Christ. Some of you are like, oh, I don't believe in Jesus. doesn't matter. You bear the stamp of God's dignity. You bear the stamp of his image. You and I were created in his image. Now, we were created to have fellowship, to commune with God. We're also created to have perfect unity and fellowship with one another. And we see that in the first marriage when Adam beholds his wife and says, Behold, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and be united with his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. He's talking about perfect unity. Perfect unity, which has not been experienced since that time. So there was perfect unity horizontally between husband and wife. There was perfect unity between man and God. God walked with them in the garden. And then they chose to go their own way. And then they chose to declare themselves independent. And then they thought that their way would be better than God's way. And they were separated from God. And sin entered the world. And Every human being born since has a streak within them of autonomy. In other words, we want independence. We want things our way. We don't, we don't naturally seek unity. We, we're not naturally unified. We don't mutually submit to one another. We want to have our own kingdoms, and we want to be our own kings and our own queens. And because of that, there's strife, there's discord, there's relational disharmony. There's relational disharmony, all of that. But God, in his infinite wisdom and his relentless pursuit of humanity, has a plan. And he chooses Abraham, and he chooses Isaac, and he chooses Jacob, and he calls a people out of bondage in Egypt. And he says to them at Sinai, through Moses, he says, behold, I have delivered you out of bondage. You are my people, and I will be your God. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. And he begins to give them this, the, the law, the commandments. He says, you're my people, and this is how you live. And his people would, in fits of, of spurts and starts and, and falling away, would follow him for a while and then fall away, and were hopelessly, hopelessly, engaged in idolatry of the surrounding nations. Fast forward, this is a lot of human history, up until the point where at the very end, before the end of the Old Testament, you've had the, the 
the, the northern ten tribes, because of their idolatry, they've been given over and disciplined and they've been dispersed amongst the nations. And then the, the southern tribe, Judah, in f- a few hundred years later, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, they were given over to discipline and they were taken captive into Babylon. And you, you have these people that, that God says, I'm going to, you're going to be my people and here's my commandments, so keep them and worship me. And basically you have these people that are like, no, we worship these gods. We will not worship you. And, and, and God, he's got one or two options. He can just obliterate them or he can, he can stay true to his covenant, which he chooses to do, but he recognizes that there's only one hope for these people. There's only one hope for these people, and that is they need something beyond themselves. Here's the thing. Knowing what you ought to do doesn't mean you want to do it or are able to do it. Do you agree with that? So God recognizes he's chosen these people, this nation for himself, but they're stiff-necked, they're stubborn, and they're rebellious. And so he promises them. He promises them in Ezekiel chapter 36 He promises them the giving of his spirit. Ezekiel 36. Let me read for you, starting in verse 22. Ezekiel was a prophet of uh, of Israel, and he is in captivity in Babylon with the rest of the captives. And here's what he hears from the Lord. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but the sake of my name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And all nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you I vindicate my holiness before the Lord. Now catch this, verse 24. I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all countries and I will bring you to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all of your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Here's, here's, what, the, here's what God is saying to Ezekiel. Tell the people this. Currently right now, you don't have it within you to either desire my presence or want to walk in my ways. And I recognize that. And all you can think about is your own desires. But there's gonna come a day when I'm going to put my spirit in you, and when that happens, all of a sudden your wants will change. You will begin to desire that which you currently do not desire. You will begin to long after my ways, and you will begin to long after my presence because my presence will come to dwell within you. That's what Isaiah is saying in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, Emmanuel, God with us. The virgin shall be with child. God will give us his spirit. So that's one of, and there's many other prophecies. There's Joel chapter 2, which Peter brings up at Pentecost. But jump ahead to the New Testament. Jump ahead to the New Testament. So in the New Testament, this is about 400 years after Ezekiel, you have, first of all, John the Baptist. Matthew chapter Uh, 3, verse 11, John the Baptist, as he's baptizing in the Jordan for the repentance of sins, he says, right now I baptize with water, but behold, there is one among you whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John recognizes that promise that Ezekiel, it's coming. It's right around the corner. There's someone here right now who is going to baptize you in that spirit. What was prophesied 400 years ago, that heart of flesh that's going to be given, that spirit that's going to indwell you, it's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. And then Jesus, in the midst of his ministry, in John chapter 7, please turn there, John chapter 7, 
starting in verse 37. Jesus says on, the la- or it says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, John gives a little amendment here. He says, now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, future tense. For as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So Jesus is saying the same thing that Matthew is saying. And Matthew is saying the same thing that Ezekiel is saying. And then Jesus, of course, goes to the cross. He pays for the sins of the world. He gives and imputes his righteousness to those who believe in him. And just before, just before his ascension into heaven. So he spends 40 days with his disciples post-resurrection, before the ascension. And in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. This is the scripture that Thad read for us in the, in the scripture reading. And while he was staying with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. To wait for what? What's the text say? The promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, now, it's not around the corner. It's not many days from now. It's, it's right upon them. Verse 6, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of, to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons by the Father as fixed by his own authority, but you will receive, what, is, what did he say? You'll receive what? You'll receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that's the promise. That sets the stage. That sets the table. So we've heard promise after promise. God is coming. Emmanuel, which means God with us. John the Baptist. He's not here yet, but he's coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, those of you who believe, living water will spill up out of your hearts, which is referring to the coming of the Spirit. And then Jesus himself says, you're going to be baptized in the Spirit not many days from now. So when does this happen? What's the context? When does this baptism occur historically? The fulfillment, the fulfillment is on the Feast of Pentecost. You have Jews from every nation, every nation that were gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And they were worshiping in the temple. So you have thousands and thousands of Jews from every nation there. And the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the apostles. And here's what happens. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It it doesn't say there was a wind. It says there was a sound like a rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and, and divided tongues as of fire. It doesn't say that fire descended. It says divided tongues as of fire. In other words, we're not sure how to explain what we experienced, but here's what it was like. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Here it is, the baptism which Jesus promised. Now here it says they were filled with the Spirit. And what happened? It says they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now this is a double miracle. This is both a hearing miracle and a speaking miracle. Because later in in verses 5 through 11, it says that Jews from every nation, as they were listening, as they were listening to the apostles, each of them heard them speaking in their language. So this isn't stuff that can't be discerned. They're they're hearing them in their own language. Now, this perplexed them because they knew that these people didn't speak their language. And so they're saying, what is this? What does this mean? And some of them, cynical, said, ah, these people are drunk. And then Peter speaks up and says, no, 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 we're not drunk. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then he quotes Joel at length. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, 
I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. What Ezekiel was saying, what Joel was saying, what John the Baptist was saying, and what Jesus said has now occurred. It has become a historical reality. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church. On all people. All people that have trusted in Christ. They have now been baptized into the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit, into the Spirit. They have been immersed into the presence of God, and now the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within them. And what's the effect? What's the effect? Revival. Unity. Power. Here's a brief description in verse 42 through 47. At the end of this, now in between Peter saying, here's what Joel prophesied, there were 3,000 people who said, how do we then do we be saved? What do we do? And he tells them, well, repent, be baptized. And 3,000 of them did. And so here's the description of the brand new church. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread into prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. You remember that unity? It was lost in the garden. Bam, there it is. Unity. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, maintain the unity of the Spirit. He doesn't say fight for unity. He says maintain that which you've been given in the Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit if you're in Christ. We are the body of Christ. We've been unified. And here you see a perfect picture of that. Well, not perfect, but a powerful picture of that. Powerful picture. And then verse 47, praising God and having a favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who are being saved. Okay, stop. That was 2,000 and some odd years ago. Pentecost is a historical event that was unique. It was unique. It was, the Holy Spirit had not yet been sent. So this was the outpouring of the Spirit. It's a one-time deal. Or is it? A.W. Tozer, the way he phrases this, I think is helpful. He says, I do not believe in a repetition of Pentecost, but I believe in a perpetuation of Pentecost. There's a vast difference there. I believe Pentecost did not come and go, but Pentecost came and stayed. The externals are immaterial. Here's what what he's saying. You, You don't repeat Pentecost. You can't repeat Pentecost. It was a one-time event. But the outpouring of the Spirit came at that time and stayed. It's to be perpetuated. So what they experienced, the what does he say? The externals are immaterial. What are the externals? The sound of rushing wind, what seemed to be tongues of fire, the external manifestation of the Spirit, in, the, in, the, in tongues and this and that. Those things are sometimes there and they're sometimes not. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon a people or an individual, you can't predict exactly what the Holy Spirit's going to do. So what Tozer is saying is that you don't repeat Pentecost. It's never been repeated, but it's perpetuated. It's perpetuated. Now, again, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the outpouring of the Spirit? What does Ezekiel say? The purpose of the outpouring of the Spirit is so that I would take your heart of stone and give you a heart that beats after me. That I would come and I would dwell within you and my presence and my power would be with you. That's the purpose. That is as much for today as it was in the day of Pentecost. Do you know that? Have you experienced that? Some of you are like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, let's, let's, let's think through what does this mean for right now? Because that was then, but what about today? What about today? So if you're thinking, all right, that was then, this is today. How does someone like me who has, I don't know, I'm not even sure if I have the Holy Spirit, I've, if I've been baptized in the Spirit. How do, I, how do I receive the Spirit? How do I become baptized in the Spirit? Well, you're not the first person to ask that question. When, when Peter said that the prophecy of Joel is being fulfilled, he then went on, it's, it's not showing up on the screen here, he then went on to say, and you people crucified the Lord and Savior, Jesus. Now, that's awkward. 
And they're, they were, it says, the scripture says they were cut to the heart and they said, what do we do? What do we do? They, they were cut. They were convicted. They're like, oh my gosh. We were the ones that were clamoring, crucify him. Oh no, what do we do? We've crucified the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What do we do? And Peter says, well, I'll tell you what you do. What's, what's it say? What's it say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Just like we have, you will. You say, well, wait, 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 wait. Where's belief in there? I thought that we were saved because we believed, not because of repentance. Well, what do you think repentance means? To repent literally means to change one's mind. In other words, I didn't believe Jesus was Lord and Savior a week ago, but I do now. That's a turning from, that's, you can't believe without repentance. And you can't repent without believing. Some of you think you've believed, but you've never repented. You haven't believed. They're hand in hand. They're two sides of the same coin. And be baptized. Well, what does that mean? Be immersed into. Be immersed into what? What did Jesus tell the disciples before he ascended? Baptize in the name of the Father, Soul, and Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the, into the presence and the power of God. He's telling them what Jesus told them to tell them. And he's promising them what Jesus promised them. Now, what does Peter say about who this promise is for? Keep reading. For this promise is for who? You, the current listeners, and who? Your children, the next generation, and who? Everyone far off, for everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself, including those who are in North Liberty, Iowa, December 5th, 2021. Right now. That same Holy Spirit that was poured out on those people then is promised to be poured out and promised to, for us to be baptized into to experience his presence and power just like they received. Now, you say, well, what do you mean just, just like? Does that mean that we're going to experience tongues of fire and a rushing wind and, and tongues? No, the, the manifestations are immaterial. The substance is what matters because the manifestations look different all through the book of Acts and have looked different all throughout church history. But the giving of the new heart and the giving of the Holy Spirit and the giving of gifts of the Holy Spirit, different for each person, and the giving of the fruit of the Spirit is universal. And the gift of unity in the body of Christ, all of those things and the want to that we didn't have before Christ, the want to, the desire to follow him, which didn't exist, all of those are gifts of the Spirit, which are for today. Now, some of you come for traditions where you have been taught that the baptism of the Spirit, you're given the Spirit initially upon conversion. I become a Christian. I'm regenerate. I'm alive in Christ. and I've, That can't happen apart from the Spirit. But the baptism of the Spirit, that's something different. That's something extra that some Christians have and other Christians don't. With all due respect, I don't believe the Bible teaches that. Now, some of you are like, well, but, 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 wait till next week. I think we're talking about, diff we're talking about this being the filling of the Spirit. That's next week's sermon. Okay, so, so, but I want you to see here in Paul, this is Paul speaking in, in to, uh, to the church, the church in Corinth. He says, for just as the body is one, has many members, has many members, and all these members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Now look at verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Now when he says in one spirit, we were baptized, that's the same Greek construction as Jesus used in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. You will be baptized in the Spirit. So Paul's talking about what Jesus was talking about, which is what Matthew was talking about, which is what Ezekiel was talking about. He says, if you're in Christ and you're in the body, you've already received that baptism. You've already received that baptism. Now, Ephesians chapter 1. In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13. In him, you too, 
You also, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Paul told the Corinthians in chapter 6, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You have been immersed into the presence and the power of the Trinity. Now, here's a fair question. Well, Brooks, if that's true, why don't I feel it? Why don't I experience more victory in my life? Why am I so apathetic? Why is following Christ such a drudgery? Why don't I have any power? If I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, what am I missing here? It's a fair question. There's a gap. There's a gap between that which some of you possess, and I say some of you because all of you do not possess the Holy Spirit. All of you are not followers of Christ. It would be foolish for me to preach to a room full of this many people and assume that everybody knows Jesus. It's just not true. And I don't know who you are, but it's just not true. But for those of you who do know Christ, there seems to be, at least for many, a gap between what you possess and what you experience. Is that fair? Is that fair? So the question is, well, how do I get in on what I've already have? If I've been baptized in the Spirit, why? How? What? Toss me a bone here. Okay, so what all Christ followers possess is the Holy Spirit. You can't be a Christian without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so all of us have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Paul says there's one baptism. We've been baptized into the same Spirit. That's what makes us members of the body of Christ. And that's a reality. That's a reality. However, what does a Christ follower experience? Well, that depends on whether or not you're aware of what you have. You remember how we closed the service last week? Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus? Do you remember what he prayed? Just a quick review. Here's what he prayed. I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. So here's what he's praying for the church. Those who have received the Holy Spirit, which he already said in verses 11 through 14. Here's what I'm praying, that the, that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you a spirit the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. In other, and then he says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? In other words, he's praying right now that the spirit which you already possess would open up the eyes of your heart that you might perceive. You would give that spirit, same spirit would give you wisdom to know him, to know the spirit which already indwells you. In other words, you, are, you have all the riches of Christ if you are in Christ. And yet we live as paupers. We don't realize it. And, and, and what Paul is praying is that the God, the God who indwells us, the Holy Spirit, would give us wisdom that we might understand what we already possess. What we already possess. Now, now I recognize and because of time, I can't spill on into the next message. Next week is how to be filled with the Spirit, which is another way of saying how to experience that which you already possess. If, in fact, you're in Christ. If you're not, you don't have the Spirit. Nor do you have forgiveness of sins. You say, well, Brooks, that offends me because I've been brought up in the church that is completely irrelevant. Your religious tradition does not make you one with Christ. Your receiving grace by faith makes you one with Christ. And that's what Peter was talking about. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you'll be given the Spirit. That's available for all of you. So, what we're going to look at next week and the week after is how to experience that which you already possess if you are in Christ. If you are in Christ. So this morning we're going to close the service with communion. If, if you have the uh, elements, please take them out. If you do not, please raise your hand and the ushers will come around and make sure that you have one of those. So... As, uh, as the praise team comes forward, they're going to, uh, to sing, but let me just kind of set this up. 
Jeremiah says, the Lord says to Jeremiah that, that these people will find me when they seek me with all of their heart. And Jesus says, all who seek shall find me. To those who knock, the door will be open. To all who ask will receive. And to those who seek, they will find. So we come to Jesus. We come to Jesus initially because we have some need. Some need of forgiveness. Um, to, a, need of, a need to be... To, to, to have meaning in our lives. We come because Jesus has only that which he can provide for us, right? So we come to him. And then we get what we got and we go away from him, metaphorically speaking, as if we got our fix. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm inviting you to come to the table. I'm in inviting you to come to the table and have a seat with the family to sup, to dine, to break bread, to be my sons and daughters, to be my disciples. Behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. What he's speaking of is an intimacy, a fellowship, which is symbolically displayed when we break bread together. Do you know what it says about the filling of the Spirit? It says that they met together continually and they broke bread together. The reason that you and I can break bread together is because the body of Christ was broken and the blood of Christ was spilled. And when we come together as a family and we participate in communion, it reminds us of the cost of the baptism of the Spirit. It reminds us that the price of our dining and fellowship with the Savior was his blood and his body broken for us. He wants your fellowship so bad that he gave his life. And he invites us to come together as a family and sit at the table. So as you listen to this song, meditate on the cost of your baptism in the Spirit. And then we'll celebrate that together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he lifted it up, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. And then later he took the cup, and he says, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you take and drink so father we come to you with grateful and sincerely thankful hearts recognizing that you gave your son Emmanuel God with us and he lived a perfect sinless life in obedience to you and fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law and his body was broken. And Lord, we're thankful that he did not shrink away from the cup, but he drank it when he took our sins upon himself and shed his blood. So we receive this bread and we receive this juice in thankful remembrance and in hopeful expectation of his return. So thank you, Father. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the gift of salvation, but also thank you for the gift of the Spirit, whom without, there is no forgiveness of sin, and there's no presence or power. Lord, I confess that um, there are times when we as the church don't look like we've received the Spirit. We don't recognize or we don't look or resemble necessarily the church in Acts chapter 2. We're asking, Lord, that you would make that present reality of the Spirit's presence something which empowers us as well. And Lord, over the next coming weeks, over Advent season, and the years to come and the days to come, Lord, fill us with your Spirit. Fill us with your Spirit that we might experience all that you have for us with your presence and your power. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you are dismissed, um, quick announcement. I've been a pastor here 
since 1997, been preaching since the year uh, 2000, and um, some of you are like, oh no, he's resigning. No, I'm not resigning. It is my desire and it is my goal to minister here amongst you all and those whom the Lord will bring into his presence through the preaching of the gospel and your witness as the church um, until I no longer have breath or the next time I break my back, whichever comes first. So it's my goal to finish strong. Uh, It is my goal to finish strong. And it is for that reason that uh, the elders have granted me a sabbatical, which will last three months. That will start mid-January, and it will last through mid-April. I am not going anywhere. This is not preparation for a career change, Um, nor is it a vacation. Um, And I actually got an email from a former elder who's moved away that said, Brooks, heard about your sabbatical, you already had one when you were on your back. If you say that to me, I might punch you. <laughs> Actually, I won't because I'm, I'm crippled now and you could probably beat me up regardless of your age. Um, but no, it is, uh, and the sabbatical is not a response to my back um, surgery or injury. This was actually planned before I hurt myself, before, uh, before that. So um, if you would like more info I've written a very lengthy article. It's in the Grace Insider, um, which many of you received as you came in. If you did not receive it, you can grab it on your way out. Um, It goes into great detail about the purpose of the sabbatical, why it's so necessary, and how we will benefit, Stacy and I will benefit from it. There is also a a twin article, which is written by Chair of our Elder Board, Jim Sabin, which writes on the same subject, but from the elder's point of view, to help you understand their view of this and why this is occurring. So I want you to encourage you to to, to read both of those, read both of those. And after you have read those, and if you have questions, um, you can talk to anyone on our pastoral staff, the vocational pastors or the lay elders, either one. You say, well, I don't know who they are. Well, you can go to our website, graceb3.org, click pastors, and it will uh, will give you a whole list of the different individuals. Some of them you will know, some of them you won't, but there they are. So they will be happy to answer any of your questions. So God bless, go in grace. We'll see you next week.